Thank you, Jonathan. Um, let me see what happens if I do this. Excellent. I think we okay. see it. Okay. All right. And then I still want to see you guys if I can, but I can't. So, oh well. Um, all right, cool. So I want to thank Josh Combs for inviting me to talk about optics and give you guys a, a little change of pace. We have uh, very weak nonlinearities, but we have huge photons. Um, and okay, so we, we are trying to um, find a way uh, to make uh, GKP states with optics. And um, on, the, uh, on the way to that, we, we stumbled on, uh, on lots of interesting things. Um, for quantum state estimation and quantum state preparation. So I will, I will give you a sense of that. This is the group um, Raj has left. He's uh, graduated. They all do that. Damn. And um, he went to Caltech to work with Ali Reza Marandi, which filled me with, filled me with pride. Uh, Raf uh, didn't graduate because he came uh, as a graduate of uh, the first PhD student of Nick Menikuchi. Hello, Raf. I know you're here. Um, and he went to Cal Caves at Seaquick, and now he's back uh, in Australia, RMIT University with Nick. And this work has been done by Raj and Miller, um, who is up and coming, uh, now middle-aged grad student. And also uh, Dr. A, who was uh, the uh, initial, did the initial uh, tomography experiments on that. And is now with Alberto Marino at Oklahoma. Xuan and Chen Hung are squeezers, and Carlos is our in house theorist uh, postdoc. And so uh, these are the collaborators we work with. They're on lots of different things um, Nick and Raf. So these are past, present, future collaborators. There are, there are things that uh, collaborations with Nick ebb and flow, which we have, we have organic cycles of collaborations. We've been through two already. I, I can sense a third one coming up, so this is all fun. Um, and uh, here we also, I will talk about Sewunam's uh, detectors at NIST. Thomas Gerritz has been uh, also a big help. And Yunshin Kim at Imperial College uh, for the theory we worked um, in particular here. So we do a lot of things. Um, we do large scale cluster state entanglement. In fact, we were the first one to entangle the optical frequency comb of a single OPO. Uh, into uh, a cluster state. And we're not done doing that. We have actually big things coming uh, very soon to a reputable journal near you. And, uh, but today I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just going to talk about this quantum state engineering and characterization for quantum error correction, which really means GKP. If we don't have GKPs yet in the lab, but we are uh, trying to get them. We also do other things, quantum photonics on chip with the electrical engineers at UVA. And we are working also to try to understand how to quantum simulate nuclear physics and condensed matter physics. All right, so non-Gaussian quantum optics is the name of the game here. We uh, care about photons and what better way to look at photons than to detect them and to have an ideal Fox state projector, uh, a POVM that's pure in terms of a Fox state basis, that would be nice. Well, it's close enough with a superconducting transition edge sensor, which is a very, very nice device that Sewunam uh, actually perfected from, uh, was used for astronomy, for detecting feeble light from a universe, and he turned that into a quantum optics machine. That's fantastic. So it's a little piece of tungsten. It's 20 micron by 20 micron, and there's an optical fiber that delivers photons on it. It's cold. It's cold. It's very, very cold because this is a resistance versus temperature. This is sort of the simplified schematic of the normal resistance of metallic tungsten. And then when you get down to close to 100 millikelvin, that drops to zero because that's a superconducting transition. OK, so if you hold your uh, piece of tungsten right here, if a photon is absorbed, then you get some heating. A just tiny about amount of heating on that very steep slope will give you a change of resistance that's uh, big enough to be read by uh, a little circuit um, with a magnetic induction with a squid readout. And then you can see a little signal that's relatively sharp rising front. It's not super sharp, it's 100 nanosecond-ish. And then some um, 
cooling, which is when the thing cools back. So there's a weak thermal link here so that the TS is cold, but doesn't, is not so well cooled that you wouldn't even see the photon uh, heating it up. That would defeat the purpose, right? So you don't want to, you don't want to have that. So you have a weak thermal link so that you can get a peak and then in the cooling, when it cools, it's still alive. It's still, it's not like quenching of an avalanche photodiode. It's still a detector that can detect more photons. And if you have photons arriving at random, like we've done, like fools where we were for a long time, well, you get photons arriving at, at random, but you can still, if they're not too often, you can see uh, one photon peak, two photon peak, three photon peaks, and you know, you can tell how many photons you have at a time. Now we've decided to actually pulse everything. And uh, now we got all our photons together. So we got like nice clean uh, uh, signals. And then we just go by the peak height and we know exactly one, two, three, four, five. Uh, if we go above five, then if you go above five, you can see that you're gonna get out of this transition slope and you're gonna get into the, the, the tungsten is gonna get so hot, so to say, that it's gonna turn normal again, um, metal, metallic, uh, ohmic conductor, and then resistance is not going to change that much with the temperature anymore. And so you don't get a, a, a different peak height, but you do get a different cooling time from the different tails. The more energy you have, the longer it takes to cool. And in fact, you can still use that signal. And we're working on that to uh, develop the electronics to do that. Um, and the group of Andrew White at the University of Queensland has done that very well at 800 nanometer photons. They can see up to five. For now, we can see up to five, uh, sorry, Andrew White sees up to 15 photons. We see up to five and a half, almost six. It's not a very well resolved peak here. So it's like, you know, the top of the transition edge, but we can really resolve zero, one, two, three, four, five really well, right? And so then you means that you can get some nice photon number probability distributions. And that is pretty darn useful because, okay, so that's um, Aaron Miller who was um, at NIST um, a little bit and Aaron Albion College and has found, found the quantum opus and does very nice uh, superconducting nanowire detectors now. Um, and he installed that, that thing for us um, in 2011. These are the little, um, Ferrule that holds the single mode fibers, tungsten chip is somewhere in there. And this is all mounted there. There's a squid box here. And what we use those photon number resolving detectors for, we use them for everything. So first we're gonna use them for state estimation. So particularly reconstructing the Vigna function. So the first, um, Proposal for doing that used quadrature detection. So quadrature detection, you had your unknown quantum state here. You had a local oscillator here, which is phase tunable, and you do a balanced homodyne detection. And that was proposed by uh, Michael Raymer and his uh, group in 93 and demonstrated at the same time. And this is uh, very nice because it basically measures a slice in, in the Wigner function in phase space, and it's really a tomographic measurement. And then you can, uh, with an inverse Radon function a transform, you can reconstruct the Wigner function. The problem is that it's it works very well. Lots of groups are doing that in quantum optics very, very well, but it's fairly uh, numerically intensive uh, as a reconstruction. So there's another method that's much simpler, but it uses uh, photon number resolving detection, which is uh, hard to come by and came of age. Well, thanks to Sebunam, now we have it, so we can play with that. So the principle of this is different. Um, instead of having a strong local oscillator here to do a homodyne detection, that this is an advantage because that strong local homodyne um, local oscillator actually act as a gain for the homodyne detection. Here we have a very weak um, local oscillator and I'm, I'm not gonna ignore that for now. Let, just ignore that beam splitter, all that crap. Just get your signal, the quantum state goes straight to the detector and lots of identical copies are detected in the FOC, FOC basis, you know, time after time. And then you get some um, photon number probability uh, distribution for that particular quantum state that you're trying to measure. Well, it turns out that the Royer uh, theorem for the Wigner function tells you that the 
Wigner function at the origin is nothing else but the expectation value of the parity, photon number parity operator. And that you've heard before, I'm sure, because in, uh, at Yale uh, with the, the superconducting um, uh, qubits, they do that all the time. They measure parity. Um, but here we're going to measure the photon number, not the parity directly. We're going to measure the photon number, get the probability distribution, and then we can calculate the expectation value of any function of a photon number that we want. In particular here, we're going to get the Wigner function at uh, the origin. OK, but now we want the Wigner function everywhere. How do we do that? Well, that's where this uh, thing comes in here. It looks like a coherent state that's tunable in amplitude and phase, which it is, but it's not really a intense local oscillator. It's a fairly weak um, um, coherent state. It's just there to displace. I'm losing my marker sometimes. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you guys, I hope you guys see my, uh, my cursor. Um, um, yeah, so that guy, that uh, coherent state just uh, is used to give me a displacement, uh, which is a displacement operator here. That beam splitter is strongly unbalanced. It's transmitting practically 100% of a state and just an epsilon this, uh, of this is reflected. And so you got R alpha displacement uh, with an alpha uh, coherent state and you can have an intense laser there. So it's not a problem. And then you raster scan basically that Wigner function, you measure it at the origin, but you know you move it, you translate it, you do a raster scan you all over the place and then you can actually reconstruct the Wigner function. We've done that. So that was first proposed by Valentovitz and Vogel, and also by Banasek and Wojtkiewicz at almost the same time in 1996, and um, was done by uh, Banasek and Valentovitz and with, with limited implementations. But with photon number resolving detectors, we were the first one to do that, detecting more than one photon at a time. And we've uh, do the, done the tomography of a single photon Fox state. And you see that it's very, very incomplete, right? We just got the, 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 the central part of it that was published last year in Optica. And, but the nice thing about this work is that we had a um, completely, this is a completely raw data. All these black dots that you see here, they are uncorrected on, uh, there's no assumption for anything. This is just what we see, the data. And you see that there's a negativity here. There's a negativity here that's pretty visible, right? And, and uh, this is with 58% detection efficiency overall, the whole complete system detection efficiency. So it could be better, but okay, that's the best we could, we could get. And, um, but we were very happy to see negativity. But now we uh, have a way better way to do it, way better way to do it, which is gonna allow us to really tomograph efficiently the states that we are going in engineered and something that Raj invented um, um, out of his feverish mind. Uh, also comes with a discussion with myung Shik Kim on the right. Um, excellent collaboration and still Sewu and Thomas for the PNR part. And the idea in a nutshell is to say, okay, remember I had my unknown quantum state. These are Wigner function now, but it's the same thing as a density operator, doesn't matter. And here my coherent state. And I had my completely unbalanced beam splitter so that I would not mess up with my quantum state, send it directly to my PNR and have a little displacement there. Fine. When then Raj said, well, I think I want to try a 50-50 beam splitter here. And then I looked at him in group meeting and said, you're insane. You're gonna lose half the light. You're gonna hurt yourself. It's not gonna be good. You're never gonna graduate and all these sorts of things. And then Raj and Miller looked at me with a little smile and they said, no, we think it works. And they were right. So what happens here? Well, it's true that you lose half the light, but basically what happens on the PNR detector here, whoa, going too fast, okay, whatever. On the PNR detector, what you get is not the displaced quantum state row here, but you get the overlap integral between the two Wigner functions, right? And uh, the, 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 the coherent state. And so this is a two photon state just because it looks just for change, the one photon states, and then you want a two photon state. 
and the coherent state and then the overlap is the red thing here. And that's what we're going to sample from with our photon number detector right here, okay? And if you look at when the beam splitter is super unbalanced, so that this guy is transmitted almost 100%, then what you get is that that coherent state is actually almost like a delta function, if you look at the math. And that's exactly the Valentowitz, Vogel, um, uh, Banasek, Wojtkiewicz uh, method, which is a sampling point by point of a Wigner function and reconstruction. But here we have a, a different way to do that. Uh, we don't get the Wigner function, but we're gonna get the density matrix. And the nice thing about this coherent state, I keep losing that. Okay. I, I usually don't use PowerPoint, I use Keynote. That's, that's uh, my bad. Um, that coherent state here, because it's a balanced beam splitter, we're going to take advantage of this ex extension of that coherent state and the wings of that state um, and all the overlap, because that, that overlap actually covers quite a bit of phase space instead of just one point. And that's actually very useful. Okay, so this is the, the I'm going to skip that really quick, but the way it works is that you write the density operator in the FOC basis. You write these overlaps. These overlaps are what we measure, right? Uh, this is the fidelity. The, 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 the overlap of the Wigner functions is the fidelity. So I didn't mention that, but it's a theorem that you know. It's the, just um, the trace of a product of a density operator is the fidelity of the two inputs. Now that fidelity is what we measure. The alpha is a calibrated, alpha j is a calibrated coherent state and alpha and its phase. So it's complex number is completely determined in amplitude and phase by experiment because we lock the heck out of everything. Or if we don't, we build it so well that it doesn't drift, we'll need to lock it. So that overlap is written in the fog basis as you know the product of these coefficients that come from the um, coherent state and the density matrix element. And now we can write everything in matrix form and they have a luvial vector for the density matrix. My vector of data here and a bunch of coherent state parameters that I know because I set them experimentally. If I invert that matrix, I'm gonna get this in terms of everything else. Now matrix inversion is not always cool because sometimes the matrix is ill-conditioned, the problem is ill-conditioned, and you end up with populations that are negative on your density operator and all sorts of crap like that you don't want. So what Raj said to do is that, hey, we're gonna do semi-definite programming with this. And the nice thing about semi-definite programming problems is that you can introduce some constraint like these for the density operator that guarantee the, um, the physicality of the results and it's computationally efficient. And you can also remove the, I'm gonna jump over this really, really fast, but you can actually deconvolve losses. Like if you have a four photon state and you have some loss, well, then what is what you're gonna measure, right? You're not gonna measure four all the time. Sometimes you're gonna get three photons. Sometimes you're even gonna get one, fo two photons, maybe one. It's, yeah. So it depends on how much, but if you know exactly how much loss you have, if you don't, then you're screwed. Okay, forget about it, go do something else. You're not good at doing experimental physics. But if you're good, you know your losses because nobody's perfect, but you know exactly how bad you are, as Socrates would say, then you can say, hey, I know uh, the loss mechanism. It's a Bernoulli um, transformation, it's a binomial distribution. Um, you can write the quantum optics for this. And you can write it for not just the populations, not just the photon number probabilities, but for any element of the density matrix. And that actually, we didn't invent that. That was invented by Keith Herzog and Leonard in 95. It's called the Bernoulli transformation. And uh, that uh, can be written as a problem, uh, another matrix inversion problem. Hey, there you go. So that's your original uh, matrix. That's the loss and that's what you get. Well, if you can, you know, invert that guy. Turns out it's always invertible because it's triangular. It's the inverse is always defined, but sometimes the problem is ill-conditioned. And so you're gonna get problems. And so you use semi-definite programming. Yeah, again, and it works super well. And- Yeah, just as a heads up, five minutes to questions. Five minutes to questions, yeah. That's true, yeah, that's, uh, I completely agree, thanks. 
<laughs> so um, this is a simulation that um, Rajan Miller did for 40% losses. This is a coherent state. This is a four photon Fox state. This is a cat state. You see that they don't look very, very um, negative uh, Vigna functions. And uh, this is the deconvolution pro pro procedure that restores uh, almost the perfect with the fidelities. Vigna function. So we did that with a, an OPO. It's way below threshold and um, has uh, photon pairs that are very narrow band spectrum. Uh, that's a nice, very stable cavity, but it's one photon pair at a time. We herald the presence of one photon that's filtered and we get the twin photon there, interferes with a laser at the same frequency, controlled in amplitude and phase, and then 50-50 beam splitter, and we see what happens. And this is what happens. This is a raw result with 50% losses. It's horrible. It, and there's a lot of noise, amplitude and phase noise. It doesn't even look uh, as immediately symmetric like a Fox state should be, but that's the raw data because we like raw data. And then you do the loss deconvolution and boom, you get the negativity back. It still looks a little bit weird, but it's much better. Now, if we do what everybody almost has ever done whenever they did tomography of a single photon state, which is assuming that it's symmetric in phase space, and then you can read a ton of experimental papers, including the first ever uh, experimental uh, realization of that. They always do that. So if we do that too, then we get a much better. So this is still data, but that's you know conveniently processed, uh, and and we get a very nice uh, result. So that that uh, this is how we're going to do our quantum state engineering characterization. Um, so that was in PR research um, this year, and now a little bit. Of non-Gaussian state engineering, so I'll have to go a little bit fast, but we want to do all sorts of nice states that you've heard um, um, before, cat state, squeeze cat state, and you know, once you have two squeeze cat state, you can make a GKP state. That's an optical um, method for do, doing that. How do we uh, engineer those states? This is what we propose to do, because it's based on photon number resolving detection. So you have photon number subtraction, photon number addition, or photon catalysis, which is basically, you have some state here, which is gonna be a coherent state all the time. You have some Fox state here, which is gonna be a single photon state because hey, that's what we can do. And then there's gonna be a photon number resolving stage at the bottom and then some output. And we um, published the results. This is a theoretical paper uh, where we show that we can use that as a GKP state generator. So this is how it works. So that's photon catalysis. Uh, you send a single photon here and you can do funny things. I'm gonna go over this really quickly. For example, here, if you have a balanced beam splitter, you have some sort of coherent state. You have a one photon um, and see that or one photon input here and two photons detected here. And then the two photon amplitude out of the output here is gone. That's a, uh, called uh, Fox state filtering. It's, it was demonstrated with, uh, you know, coincidence detections and not photon number resolving detection before by Zalinger in the mid 2000s. Uh, but it's interesting to do that with photon number resolving detectors. And you see that the Vigna functions goes from coherent state Gaussian boring to woo, nice negative non-Gaussian, right? So that's exotic state generation. And Raj found that not only does it do that, but if you tweak the alpha, then you can get exactly a single photon Fox state that's displaced by that quantity. Uh, we don't know why, but the fidelity is one with that state. So it's kind of interesting. So then uh, we were scratching our head with that. And then Miller came and said, ooh, 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 I have an idea. Let's do it over and over and over again. And then that's what, that's what happened. So you have some sort of Gaussian boson sampling, except there's not squeeze state inputs here. It's just a coherent state and a bunch of single photon um, um, and CLS. And then you have photon number detection here, photon number resolve detection here. And then you have several steps. And if you do it right, at the end, uh, you get a squeeze cat state. Um, so here you have for two, only two stages, uh, with the right results, um, one and two, I think, you have uh, this kind of state. For three steps, you have that guy. Oops. And for four steps, you have that guy, which is even more um, 
the cat state, the amplitude of a cat state, depending where you put the squeeze operator, if you put it before or after, you got two different values of the alpha, but okay, they're all there for you. Um, and so once you have a, um, uh, that's the, uh, prob the success probability is not very, very high, but nobody has very high ones. So I can, I can easily come mm -hmm. back to that later. Uh, I just, you, yeah. just so you know, we're uh, in question seconds. time now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, if you interfere those two guys uh, and you do homodyne detection, you get a GKP state. If you do PNR detection, that's what Miller and Raj found, you still get a GKP state, but you get a wider variety of things that look like may or may not be GKP states. I'm not sure that all of them are. And uh, Miller then even pushed that to some interesting way to do things. Instead of doing this squeeze cat state, you get like the trifold, threefold kind of uh, cat um, and 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 uh, those give you those kind of state and you, if you interfere them you get a hex GKP state which is I'm told by Raf and others even more useful than the regular uh, GKP state and with that I will stop and um, have uh, hope I'll be able to answer your questions thank you very much thank you very much Olivier very very nice talk and you have certainly inspired a lot of questions in the in the chat. So we'll get right awesome. to that. Uh, to start with, Raf is is asking about the, the binning process. So photon counting, uh, you can always you can always bin that to get the parity results, but he was wondering if you have any insight as to whether you could make use of the fine grain photon number resolved information to do an even better reconstruction of the state. Let me see if I understand that correctly. So if that's for the tomography. Mm -hmm. But how, um, I, what I don't understand is the photon binning. I mean, we have a single photon resolution in there, so uh, we can bin more than that. So, uh, so you, you, you I would think, say binning by larger number of photons than one. Well, I guess the, the naive reconstruction is to simply say that your Wigner function at a particular point is equal to the expectation value of the parity operator that you get from using all of this. Um, but you could think that maybe instead of just pretending that your measurement was only giving you parity information, that you could make use of the uh, extra information about what the photon numbers were. OK. So in a sense, yeah, OK, now I understand the question. So in a sense, I think that's what the generalized overlap tomography that I presented is doing, I think. Uh, I don't know how to answer that question in the context of the, uh, the parity expectation value one, because you already get all the information about the Wigner function that way. But I think with the, the overlap tomography, that's kind of what we're doing. We don't need the parity of anything. We're, we're, we're really using the photon number, the PNR information uh, uh, in earnest. To, yeah. to yeah. So I think I, I would say as a beginning of an answer, mm -hmm. that would be the... Um... Yeah, well, I think this is probably a good segue to the next question, because um, Nick was asking about using the balance beam splitter for the overlap tomography. And his question is, um, is does the parity of N in the balance beam splitter case give you the Q function instead of the Wigner function? Yes, that's what we measure. We measure the Q function. Uh, well, we, we, we measure, we sample the Q function for sure, because that's what, that's what this thing is, is the, the overlap mm -hmm. of the unknown quantum state in a, in a coherent state. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Um, Excellent. Yeah, but we, we don't, um, yeah, I didn't mention that, but it's because, because we, we really like the negativity in the Wigner function as a measure of all good things that we want to see in our experiment. <laughs> and the Q function is very, very frustrating uh, because it's never negative, but, um, but sure. yeah, no, this is what it is. Sure. Uh, we also have a question from Krista. Uh, she's asking about the deconvolution of loss and if that is unique. Um, for example, can you discriminate a coherent cat state from a mixed cat state um, with 40% loss? Oh, that's a great question. I believe we can. Um, so I believe we can. Um, okay, let me put that. Here. And then oh, 
Okay, well, Zoom is just uh, <laughs> Zoom is just trying not to cooperate. There we go. I like to see everybody when I talk. When uh, just a second here. I'm very pedestrian and I'm wasting time. And it's well, it's late for me. It's not late for you guys because it's Friday. <laughs> All right, here we go. Where is that slide? So I'm going to say that if I had a mixture, right, I would have something like that. This is the losses. This is the losses, 40% uh, loss and no deconvolution, right? Just take the hit. Uh, I think if, if you're trying to show us a picture, I think we've got a very narrow uh, shot of your screen right now. Huh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let me try something else. Well, that looks better, I think. Okay. All right. If you could see my screen there, it's <laughs> I'm I'm basically blind here. Okay, you guys see you guys see something? We see a, a white square. Oh. This is awkward. Yeah, because uh, I don't see, I don't see anything. Hold on. It's all right. We've got we've got a lively discussion in the the chat, keeping people occupied. So, oh, there we go. Yeah. Now. Okay. You guys see better now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm I'm not gonna mess too much with it, but this is the losses. So that's coherent state, the four photon state. That's the cat. And you see that that looks like a mixture, right? Because all the interferences in phase space have washed out. And, and my criteria for saying, oh, okay, we look really good now um, is when we do loss reconstruction, we've actually compared that to an ideal pure cat state and that's the fidelity. Mm -hmm. so the, the, the loss deconvolution. Now the, 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 the price to pay if you wanna do a loss deconvolution the more loss you have, the more data you're going to have to take. Yeah. Because, yeah, <laughs> it's going to be sensitive to noise. But yeah, but you can do a good job, in, at least on paper. In theory, you can do a very, very good job. And going back to the pure state. Very nice. Uh, I think there might have been one or two more questions in chat. Maybe people are interested in sticking around to do that. But if people have to leave, maybe now is a good time to just take another opportunity to thank Olivier and all the other uh, speakers from the session. Uh, so this has been- I'm happy to go to Slack and, um, and address if you guys wanna ask me more questions, uh, please do. Thank Excellent. you for sharing this now, Oh, of course. <laughs> and the, uh, the next session is in five hours. So I guess uh, 